As always, it's great to look over the audience and to see everyone. Good to see our sister Doris tonight. Uh, the slide told us that there'll be some meeting with the doctor tomorrow to determine her future treatment. So let's keep Doris and Randy always in our prayers. Good to see our sister Ann tonight. She's been having some difficulties. Good to see our sister Sharon Sisk. Uh, she was here this morning, but I know she's been dealing with some problems herself, and so good to see each and every one here this evening. Now, this month, the month of February, we have turned our attention to the topic, of course, of grace. And we've had some wonderful comments from everyone concerning this series and, and what it means to you, uh, the way you're looking forward to it. So I appreciate that very much because we need to be considering and remembering what grace is in our lives. Uh, we've done this every time, the definition, God's unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor in saving man from the guilt and consequences of sin. The definition itself tells us of the importance of this topic. God's favor in saving us from the guilt and consequences of sin. And so, again, what we did is last Sunday, morning and evening, we emphasized the importance of grace. This morning, grace, the foundation for Christian living. Remember, that was from Titus, the second chapter, verses 11 through 15. And, of course, tonight we're going to be looking at a grace Powered life. Now, all of our lives are powered by something. They are motivated, they are inspired by something. What I'm saying this afternoon is that grace really is the only thing worthy to power our lives, to motivate us, to inspire us. Many things have been used to inspire people. Many things that are bad have been given to, to motivate. Think about this with me. Some people live a sin-powered life. God told Cain, sin is crouching at the door, is desirous for you, and you must master it. Genesis 4, verses 6 and 7. Notice he said you must master it, not you need to follow it. In fact, in Exodus 23 and verse 2, you shall not follow a multitude in doing evil. So again, a sin-powered life is a miserable life. Uh, some have a pride-powered life. And you know what inspiration says about that? Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. If that's where we want our life to end up, then let's just have a pride-powered life. Again, a pleasure-powered life. And we're talking about the pleasures of sin. Hebrews 11 and verse 25, they're only for a very, very short time. And remember, the problem with that is, you know what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 4, men become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And so this takes us away from our Heavenly Father, an anger-temper-powered life. We've probably all seen someone, they're always upset, they're always angry. They, they don't have control of their temper, and that's what motivates them. That seems to inspire them. That's what powers them through life. And what a terrible existence. Again, a possessions-powered life. We just gather up things and we think we're going to be happy. We think that's going to make life have meaning. You remember Jesus taught the parable in Luke 12 beginning in verse 16 concerning that rich farmer. He was blessed abundantly. Didn't know, did he, what to do with his possessions. Was going to use them selfishly for just himself. And Jesus prefaces that parable by saying, we need to take care. And we need to beware of covetousness because he says, even when we have abundance, our life does not consist of our possessions. And so a possessions 
empowered life is really an empty life. Even though we have a lot, we'll still be living an empty life. A money riches powered life. You remember the love of money. It's the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 and 10. And you cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew 6 and verse 24. So again, this all becomes empty. It all becomes so vain. A guilt or shame powered life. And there's probably nothing worse than this. Were they ashamed because of all their abominations? No, they were not ashamed. They did not even know how to blush. Jeremiah 6 and verse 15. And a lust powered life. When we just live like mere brute beasts, we just live like the animal kingdom lives, based upon our desires, based upon our passions. You remember in 1 John 2, verses 15 and following, Do not love the world, neither the things of the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the vain glory of life, these are not from the Father, but of the world. And this world and its lust are passing away. But the one who does the will of God will abide forever. Notice that contrast. This world and its lust, it's passing away. But the one who does the will of God will abide forever. I'll guarantee you the one who's doing God's will has a grace-powered life. It's a life motivated by our gracious God. Now, all of these have consequences. What we've just looked at, all of these have consequences. And again, the consequences are not good. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6 and verse 23. They cannot power your life, but they can certainly destroy it. They can't help you, but those things certainly will harm you. Nothing can power your life like grace. And again, nothing can bring the blessings that grace can. One last thought here. Nothing will provide the glorious outcome that grace can provide. Now we've said all of this because I want us to get to Romans, the fifth chapter. Romans 5, verses 1 through 2, that which Stephen read just a moment ago, Again, this is a great depiction, if you will, of a grace-powered life. Now, as we read through this, I want you to look at what you find associated with grace. Because the principle, remember Matthew 19 and verse 6, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. That is a general principle in Matthew 19 being applied specifically. It's applied specifically to marriage there. But that principle is true regarding anything. Whatever God's joined together, let no man put it asunder. Don't, let no man divide it. And you think about what we're looking at tonight. Join together with grace. Let's not ever be foolish enough to separate these things. Read this with me. Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Let's read it again. Look at the things that Paul is talking about here. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom, well, we just went too far, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. There are several things that we can talk about tonight. I just want to mention very quickly seven of these. We're moving quick because of the number seven. I know that's a lot, but look at this, a grace powered life. Think with me tonight. A grace-powered life, going back to Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, is a life that enjoys justification. Justification. That's a grace-powered life. When we think about justification, this is the act of a judge. Judge. 
Do you remember in Psalm 7 and verse 11, God is a just judge and a God who is angry every day with the wicked. And so we're talking about justification. This is an act of a judge. This is the judicial act of God by which he pardons the sins of those who have faith in Christ Jesus. And so this is his act. As a judge, he justifies, he makes us just. Again, think about this, law in this case. Law is not relaxed, nor is law, God's law, it's not set aside, but it's declared to be fulfilled in the strictest sense. God in Christ has declared that we are now just. And so this is a glorious truth, a grace-powered life. It is a life that enjoys justification. I like what one person said about justification. He said, it's just if I'd never sinned. And so think about that when you think about justified. What does that mean? A big word, even a greater concept. Justified, justified never sinned. God declares us to be just. God declares us to be righteous in his sight. Not by setting aside his law, but by us who have come to Christ, now by merit of his righteousness, we can be just in the sight of God. We can be righteous based upon his righteousness. Now, think of a few verses with me. Specifically, these verses in the book of Romans. You know, when we think about Romans, Romans, the first chapter, we understand that the Gentiles are declared to be in sin. And of course, the Jews love that. But in Romans 2, Paul turns it to the Jews and says that they likewise are guilty of sin. And then in chapter 3, it reaches that climax, all have sinned. Jew and Gentile together. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Take your Bibles right there. Turn with me to Romans, the third chapter. I want us to read verses 23 and 24. Because now we're getting to what we're talking about. It's a life that enjoys justification. How can we be termed just? How can God call us righteous? How can he make a sinner justified? Well, the answer is found here. It's again in Christ Jesus. Look what it says here. Romans 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now listen to this. Having, uh, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's how we're justified. It's because we can be redeemed, bought back as we studied this morning. That's the act of grace. And so redemption, which is in Christ, we're justified, justified by faith. We have access now into this grace. How thankful we ought to be for that. And think about this also. Turn with me to Romans, the fifth chapter. In Romans 5, notice the basis of this justification is the death of Christ. It is the blood of Christ. Look at Romans 5 and verse 9. It says, Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And so we're justified. How? By his blood. And that justification comes through his resurrection. You remember in Romans 4 and verse 20, uh, 25? Romans 4 and verse 25, he was delivered up for our transgressions. He was raised for our justification. And so it's by his blood. It's through his resurrection. In a very negative way, we are justified and we're justified from the wrath of God. Again, Romans 5 and verse 9. But in a very positive way, those he justified, he also glorified. Romans 8 and verse 30. And so justification, we're talking about a grace-powered life. 
Well, that grace-powered life is a life that enjoys justification. Again, it is a life of faith. All of this is mentioned in Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. It's a life of faith. You remember Hebrews 11 and verse 6, without faith, it is impossible for a man to please God because the one that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so without faith, we can't please God. You remember in John 20 and verse 27, what Jesus told Nicodemus? I mean, what he told Thomas. You remember what he said? Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And so he's pleading for faith. He wants them to understand that this life that he's called them to live, it's a grace-powered life. And it is a life of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. And so turn with me to the book of Romans again. In Romans, the third chapter, look at this. Romans 3, read with me, if you will, verse 20. Verse 20, because this is what you're going to see in the book of Romans. Justification does not take place through the merits of the law. Notice what it says. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But jump ahead to chapter 3 and verse 28. Look what this says here. It says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So a man is justified by faith. A grace-powered life, it's a life of faith. Faith comes by hearing, Paul will tell us later in Romans 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You remember in the Old Testament, Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. It's really a principle that everything rests upon. In fact, the New Testament acknowledges the veracity of Habakkuk's statement. The just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. And so Paul picks that up in the book of Romans. Romans 1 and verse 17. The just shall live by faith. Paul also in Galatians 3 and verse 11. The just shall live by faith. And likewise, the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 10 and verse 38, the just shall live by faith. And so that grace-powered life, it's a life that enjoys justification. It is a life of faith, faith in Christ Jesus. We walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. Notice this next point here. A grace-powered life it's a life of peace with God. All of this emerging from Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. These are things that God has joined together. And so a grace-powered life is a life of peace with God. You remember in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, Jesus is referred to there, that child that will be given to us, that child will be born. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, Prince of Peace. That's what he is. He himself is our peace. Ephesians 2 and verse 14. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Isaiah 57 and verse 21. And so when we look at this, how special this is. A grace-powered life is a life of peace with God. Think with me about just a few verses here. In Romans, the 14th chapter, in Romans 14 and verse 17, it tells us here that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so that's what a grace-powered life is all about. It's about peace with God. And the kingdom, the kingdom's not about eating and drinking. It's not about physical things. It's about spiritual things, righteousness, peace, and joy. You remember in Romans 3, 
In Romans, the third chapter, in verse 17, it's really a verse, I guess, we overlook because we like to go to Romans 3 and talk about there's none righteous, no, not one. And that's true, Romans 3 and verse 10. We would like to mention verse 18, there's no fear of God before their eyes. We've already mentioned Romans 3 and verse 23, all have sinned, come short of God's glory. But in Romans 3 and verse 17, he says, The way of peace they have not known. Well, that's just as telling as anything else that he says about them in Romans, the third chapter. The way of peace they have not known. But when we live a grace-powered, a grace-motivated life, the way of peace we can know. And we can know it because of Jesus the Christ. Again, it's because of his kingdom, what it's comprised of, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Two verses later in Romans 14 and verse 19, pursue the things that make for peace in the building up of one another. Turn with me for a moment to Romans 15. Look at this in Romans 15. We're talking still about peace because this is what we have when we live the kind of life that we ought to be living, a grace-motivated, a grace-powered life. Look at verse 13 of Romans 15. It says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. And then look, if you will, one last verse here concerning this peace. Look, if you will, at verse 33. Verse 33 of chapter 15. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. I said one last. Let's just add one more. Go to chapter 16. Look at verse 20. Notice at the close of this book what Paul has in mind. Look what he says. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And so a grace powered life. Paul is talking about these things in the book of Romans. It's a life that enjoys justification. It is a life of faith. It is a life of peace with God. Again, you remember in Colossians 1 and verse 20, he, it's talking about Jesus, he made peace through the blood of his cross. This peace we're talking about, it came at a very high price. He made peace all right. He himself is our peace. Again, Ephesians 2 and verse 14. But he made peace through the blood of his cross. And let's not ever, ever forget that. Think with me about this next point. I think this might be the one that we overlook more often than any other one. A grace-powered life is a life that has access with God. Now this term, access, this Greek word, it literally means to lead to. And so here's what Vines says about this idea, this concept of access. He says, a leading or bringing into the presence of. Then he goes on to say, the thought of freedom to enter through the assistance or favor of another. Well, the point that Paul is making when he talks about access, there are three verses in the New Testament that use this term. We'll look at those in just a moment. But this is how we gained our access into this grace. It's because Jesus Christ, if you will, he became our sponsor. He is our advocate. He is the one that is leading us. He is the one that is bringing us into this grace. We have access, and it's only through Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus himself said in John 14, 6? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. You can't gain access any other way than Jesus the Christ. Now, here's what's so special about this concept. Go back tonight and, and think about the book of Esther. And when Mordecai challenges her to go before the king, remember what she says? I can't. I can't go before the king. It's not according to the law. He has not granted me the royal scepter. 
You see, in that day, if the sovereign did not grant you the royal scepter, you didn't have access to him. And if you went in without that access, without that royal scepter, your life could be taken. And so she's saying, I, I don't have that. He hasn't given me the royal scepter. I can't gain access with him. Here's what I'm saying based upon the New Testament truth that we have access, we can find the Father through Christ. The royal scepter has been given to us. We can approach the Father's throne of grace any time, and we can do so boldly. Hebrews 4 and verse 16. How and why do we do that? Because we have access. We have access. Jesus Christ, he's our advocate. He's our savior. He's our intercessor. He's our mediator. Our access is gained through him. Now look at these verses again. Go back with me to Romans 5. Look at Romans 5 and notice what it says here about this access. And don't forget this. Again, God, you know, the prayer of the upright is his delight, Proverbs 15 and verse 8. We have that access. We can go to him at any time of the day or night because it has been granted to us to do that. We have been given, extended, if you will, the royal scepter through Jesus our Lord. Why don't we use that access like we ought, like we should? Romans 5 again. Look what it says. Just read with me verses 1 and 2 again. And note this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice and hope in the glory of God. We have access. Look, if you will, at the book of Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, notice this. Ephesians, the second chapter. Look, if you will, verse 18. Ephesians 2, look at verse 18. It says, for through him. Now, this is talking about our Lord. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now that both, that's Jew and Gentile. Through him, we have access. We both have access. And look again at Ephesians, the third chapter. Look at Ephesians 3, and specifically look at verse 12. Ephesians 3 and verse 12. In whom, now once again, we're talking about Jesus. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. I presented a lesson one time based upon Ephesians 3 and verse 12. And we simply call it the ABCs of Christianity or the ABCs of spiritual blessings because we have access, we have boldness, we have confidence. What more could we ask as children of God. Access because of Jesus. Boldness. We can approach his throne of grace. And we have confidence. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4 and verse 13. And so we have access. A grace-powered life is a life that has access with God. A grace-powered life is a life that stands. You remember that phrase in... Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. We can stand. Now, here's what's interesting. In the first psalm, it talks about the blessings of the righteous. Then it goes to the wicked, and, and the wicked are not like this. And it says that they will not stand. They will not stand before God. Some have tried to misuse that. And, you know, imply that later on in the book of Romans, Romans 14, verse 10 and 12, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, some have said, well, the wicked are not going to stand because that's what Psalm 1 says. This is talking about it's a life that stands approved by God. It's a life that has his approval. And that's really what Psalm 1 is all about. The wicked will not stand approved. They will be there. 
On the day of judgment, when we all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, when all nations are gathered before him, Matthew 25 and verse 31, oh, they will be there, but they will not stand justified. They will not stand as acceptable with God. In fact, really that's the emphasis of Psalm 130, verse 3. If thou, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who would be able to stand? And they're asking, who could be standing justified before you if you marked iniquities? And the answer is no one. And you know the next verse says, but there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. The only way we can stand justified is through Christ and living a grace-powered life. We can stand. We stand. The Bible tells us in Romans, the fifth chapter in verse two, we stand in grace. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse one, we stand in the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13, we stand in faith. And also in Galatians 5 and verse 1, we stand in liberty, but we stand. And we stand approved before God. We stand justified in His sight. Again, all of these, the blessings, the benefits of a grace-motivated life. Again, number six, it's a life that rejoices. That's what Paul says, Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. A grace-powered life is a life that rejoices. You remember in Psalm 4 and verse 7, Thou hast put gladness in my heart. Well, God wants to do that for all of us, to put gladness in our hearts. You remember when Jesus was teaching those who came back from the commission? You remember in Luke 10 and verse 20, he says, Do not rejoice that the spirits are made subject to you, but rejoice that your names are enrolled in heaven. That's what we can rejoice in, that we're living the Christian life. We're living a life that brings honor and glory to him. It brings joy and happiness to us. It also helps those who are outside to see, to see the life that they too can be living. But it's a life that rejoices. You remember in 1 Peter, the first chapter, in verse 8 and 9, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, having as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. Well, that's the kind of joy that we should have. And that's the kind of joy that you see throughout the book of Romans. In Romans 12 and verse 12, rejoicing in hope. In Romans 12 and verse 15, we weep with those who weep, but we rejoice with those who rejoice. Again, Romans 14 and verse 17, the kingdom, again, is not eating and drinking. What is it then? It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We have this joy in Christ. And one last thought here. A grace-powered life is a life full of hope. You remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19? If we have hoped of Christ in this life only, we're of all men most to be pitied. Paul's point in, in 1 Corinthians 15, you know that's the great resurrection chapter. And he's trying to show that if Jesus was like anyone else, and if Jesus just came and lived and died, and that's it. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, if that's it, then we're of all men most to be pitied. He goes on to say, but he was raised from the dead. He's the first fruits of those who are asleep. But again, we don't hope of Jesus in this life only. Our hope is a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. And so you remember in Colossians 1 and verse 27, in that context, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And earlier in Colossians 1 and verse 5, 
You know, it talks about the hope laid up for you in heaven. That's the hope that we're talking about. We're talking about that living hope. We have it through Christ. And as we live that grace-motivated life, it's a life full of hope. Romans 5 and verse 5, hope does not disappoint. Romans 8 and verse 24, hope saves. Do you realize that we are saved by hope? It's not hope alone. In the New Testament, there are many things that Scripture tells us saves us. It's not by one of them alone. It's by all of them. And this hope, this great anticipation that we have. You remember in Hebrews, the seventh chapter and verse 19, the Hebrew writer talks about a better hope. And that's what we have. That's what we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Again, we've already mentioned in Romans 12 and verse 12, now he's talking about rejoicing in hope. That's what we do. We rejoice. We rejoice in this living hope that we have. One last verse here. Turn back with me. It's one we've already read. But how powerful this is. In Romans 15, Look what it says. Romans 15, we want to read verse 13 once again. Paul, as he's talking about grace, as he's talking about justification, as he's talking about all of these things that we're mentioning tonight. Look what he says in Romans 15 and verse 13. Look what he says. Now may the God of hope. Notice that the God of hope. You remember what we talked about a couple of weeks ago? You know, in Philippians 4 and verse 7, the peace of God, and in verse 9, the God of peace. He's the God of peace. Yes, he is. And we have to know the God of peace before we can know the peace of God. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, the manifold grace of God. But in 1 Peter 5 and verse 10, it talks about the God of grace. And so the God of grace, the God of peace, the God of hope, that's what Paul says here. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That you may abound in hope. Once again, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We abound in that hope. Again, that hope. Remember in Titus 1 and verse 2? God who cannot lie promised long ages ago. He says, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised long ages ago. That's our hope. Our hope is in Christ because it's a living hope based upon his resurrection. We know that we too will be raised with him. A grace-powered life. Any other life that we're going to live, it's not going to have any power. We sing about there's power in the blood. There is. There's power in our Heavenly Father. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask and think. Ephesians 3 and verse 20. There's power in our blessed Lord, in the life that He lived, the death that He partook of for us. There's power in the weapons of his warfare. Look at Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. There's power. There's a power in grace. And we can live a grace-powered life. And when and if we do, we reap all of the benefits, all of the blessings. All spiritual blessings are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Friend, what about your life tonight? We're all motivated by something. Our lives are all powered by something. What is it? Is it what we began with that cannot help you but can only hurt you? Or is it, or is it as we've ended up, a grace-powered life? A life that every morning realizes that his mercies, his benefits, they're new every morning. They're that fresh. Read Lamentations, the third chapter, the middle of that context, verses 22 through 24. They're new every morning. 
new challenges, new opportunities, new things that we can do in Christ Jesus to bring him honor, to bring him glory. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. Galatians 6 and verse 10. If your life is not powered by grace, it can be. It certainly should be. And you can change things tonight. You know, apart from me, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15 and verse 5. Let's realize that. Let's understand that. As we live based upon our own strength, our own power, we're living weak and really miserable lives. But as we turn to Jesus, our lives can be strengthened, our hearts can be enlarged. We can live a life that will bring glory to Him. If that's your desire tonight, we encourage you to come. If you've never obeyed the gospel, let's come and learn how to do that. If you have, but you've fallen away from the living God, let's come back to Him. Let's have Him give us that access again that is so precious, that is so needed as we go through life. You know, there are times we have to cast our cares upon Him for He cares for us. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, you can't do that if you don't have access unto Him. How precious it is. If you need to come, won't you, while we stand and as we sing.